controversial because in order for this strategy to work, vampires would all have to clock out together and that implies a level of cooperation and social organization that might be unlikely given how uh, solitary and competitive these creatures were. More on that later. At any rate, we believe that this is where the blood pooling strategy got started. Part of being undead involved sequestering blood around the vital organs and letting the peripheral tissues starve, much the way seals and whales triage their oxygen supply when cut off from the air. Now, this proved so effective that over time it became a normal state of affairs even among active vampires. The ghastly white pallor of these things is actually a strategy for increasing their gas mileage. When lactate levels in the surface tissues get too high, or when vampires are feeding, blood is redirected to the skin and the muscles and the complexion flushes. Uh, the moral to this being, if you're next to a vampire and he starts looking embarrassed, you should run. But this only happens occasionally and it doesn't last long. Uh, by the way, in case you're wondering why there's uh, no particular ghastly white pallor on this one, uh, like so many of our, um, our Texas inmates, uh, this particular fellow was of African-American origin. Uh, by now, you might be wondering why vampires didn't simply resort to non-human prey. It's not as though humans were the only available meat species on the planet. Why go to all the trouble of evolving these radical, freakish adaptations to keep eating us when they could have just switched to warthogs and zebras? And in fact, they may well have done just that. But the fact that they went to such extreme lengths to accommodate human meat in the diet can only mean that they got something from us that wasn't available from other species, something essential to their survival. We actually lost a fair number of inmates uh, finding out what this was. You may remember a year or so ago when Amnesty International put out a, a press release praising Texas for going a whole two months without executing anyone. What they didn't realize was that a hiatus in executions did not necessarily mean a hiatus in mortality. We, we basically used up death row. Uh, we also used up a few grand theft autos and even some insurance fraudsters. Uh, but it was all worthwhile because this is what we found. A secondary loss of the ability to synthesize PCDHY, which is a protein responsible for certain aspects of central nervous system development. Now, since this protein occurs only in other hominids, human prey remained an essential component of the vampire diet right up until their extinction, or as some would have it, their reassimilation into the ancestral bloodline. So, what we have here is a very rare subspecies, forced to prey upon its closest kin, which themselves were quite rare, being also near the apex of the trophic pyramid. They were forced to commit a number of evolutionary backflips just to stay in the game. They were easily smart enough to outmaneuver us, but we weren't their biggest problem. Their biggest problem was just as smart as they were, and just as dependent on the limited supply of human prey. Their biggest problem was other vampires. This is what happens when you put two vampires into the same room. Competition for prey evidently ensured that these creatures were solitary, very territorial, and mutually antagonistic. Now our marketing people had entertained thoughts of teams of vampires working together to solve the world's ills, uh, but apparently natural selection never taught them to play nicely together. Uh, this shows the results of one of our pilot projects in marketing. Um, that particular project ended shortly after this picture was taken. So now you have some idea of what these creatures are. Here's where they came from. Judging by mitochondrial and junk satellite markers, we think that vampires split off from the human stock something less than half a million years ago and persisted, albeit in small numbers, into the beginning of historical times. We trace their genesis to a paracentric inversion mutation on the XQ21.3 dot on the X chromosome, resulting in functional changes to genes that code for protocoherence. Uh, PCDHY, uh, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago, is a protocoherin. And as I've also mentioned, they play a critical role in the development of the central nervous system. They occur in the headwaters of CNS development, as it were, and a relatively small change far upstream can lead to a whole variety of interrelated cascade effects further down. These include many of the features you've heard about today. Now, I'm not saying that a single mutation made all these improvements in a single lucky step. Evolution does not work that way. What I am saying is that a headwater mutation had such a huge impact on so many aspects of CNS development that basically the whole deck of cards got shuffled. Suddenly there was far more variation for natural selection to work on 
and so vampires arose relatively quickly. However, it's important to remember that natural selection does not optimize anything. Survival of the fittest is really a bullshit phrase. It would be much more accurate to say survival of the least inadequate because it doesn't matter whether a given adaptation is the best possible solution. All that matters is whether it works better than the competition. Now, overall, vampires did work better than the competition, but that doesn't mean they didn't have a few design flaws. And you've encountered the two biggies already. The broken pathway, which forced them to eat other hominids, and the defect that killed Donnie, the so-called crucifix glitch. Now, it is this glitch that doomed them from the moment we developed Euclidean architecture. Vampires would have been barred from approaching any human dwellings that featured quartered windows, supporting crossbeams, and so on. You can imagine how a resurrected vampire would react to a modern-day office building with its facades of repeating window frames. It's not a pretty sight. And you can be damn sure that our ancestors figured that out pretty early in the game. The cross is not an exclusively Christian icon. It's been used as a religious symbol back into prehistoric times. Now we know why. Now, you might wonder how such a lethal trait could get so fixed in the population to begin with. Shouldn't natural selection have weeded it out sooner? And the answer is surprisingly simple. The trait wasn't lethal, not at first. An aversion to crosses is no disadvantage in a world where crosses don't exist, and you don't find many right angles in nature. Any biology undergrad will tell you Neutrally selective traits can become fixed in small populations through a simple process called genetic drift. And in this case, the trait wasn't even neutral. The same cross-wiring responsible for the crucifix glitch was also involved in vampiric pattern matching skills. And that was a trait that natural selection would actively promote, right up until the point that their prey discovered geometry. Now, it's tempting to speculate uh, that this was also the source of the myth that vampires can't enter someone's house uninvited. It would be more accurate to say that vampires can't come into your house unless they keep their eyes closed. And since that would make them extremely vulnerable to attack, they would only be advised to do that when the house's inhabitants didn't wish them ill. We can also draw tentative conclusions about some of the other vampire myths that have sprung up over time. Uh, the whole blood-sucking aspect remains an open question. Technically, vampires are closer to what you might call obligate cannibals, uh, eating human flesh rather than simply drinking the blood. However, given that the only thing they really needed from us was a certain type of protein, it's theoretically possible that a blood diet could meet that need, although admittedly they'd have to drink a lot of the stuff. Perhaps this was a deliberate conservation strategy. Drinking the blood leaves you with an anemic victim that can recover over time and perhaps serve as a future food source. Uh, while eating the flesh basically relegates your victim to single serving status. As we've seen, uh, vampires could feed on other species to meet most of their dietary needs. They were much smarter than us, smart enough to figure out the virtues of resource conservation. Photosensitivity. Now, none of our subjects developed uh, Xenoderma pigmentosum, which is uh, a rare photosensitive skin condition which some have linked to vampirism in the past. Vampires do have very sensitive night vision, however, and their pupils don't react as quickly as ours to changes in light intensity. They can be easily snow-blinded, uh, as you would be if someone shone a light in your face while you were wearing night vision goggles. That wouldn't cause them to burst into flame when struck by the sun's rays, but it might explain a general aversion to bright light. A crowd of peasants with torches might present a real problem to these creatures. None of our subjects developed any kind of aversion to garlic or to any of the Amaryllidaceae species, for that matter. Uh, it's possible that vampires themselves spread this rumor to engender a false sense of security among their prey. I mean, if you think that garlic is going to keep you safe, why waste your time with this cross and crucifix stuff? But it's also possible, of course, that the whole story is pure fiction. A lot of other myths that vampires can fly or shapeshift or that they don't reflect in mirrors are likely to be mostly fiction as well. Uh, they do reflect in mirrors. That was one of the first things we tested. But it's worth remembering that these creatures are both faster and more intelligent than we are, and their superlative pattern matching skills would give them a real advantage in blending in via crypsis. It's, it's quite likely that one might seem to disappear simply by fading into shadow or adopting a posture that broke up its outline against the background. Combine such a vanishing act with, say, the flushing of some startled animal caught in the path of a departing vampire, primitive human might think that some kind of shape shift had occurred. Reproduction. 